Welcome back to King Kong Kids Storytime. We are reading The Sign of the Chrysanthemum by Catherine Patterson. Chapter 5, Fukuji. On New Year's Eve, the freezing rain turned to a wet snow. Fukuji, the swordsmith, stood in his back doorway and watched the flakes drift into the courtyard, melting as they hit the cobblestones. He would be 50 in the year ahead. By the current reckoning, he was an old man, but he neither looked nor felt old. For many years, he had kept both spirit and flesh so strictly disciplined that now his short, powerful body conveyed the vitality and alertness of a great buck deer. But as he watched the fragile flakes melt onto the stones, he felt in his heart the pain of a man who's known many years and many lives that began in brightness only to fall and disappear. Suddenly, he was homesick for snow, snow such as fell in his native province. He longed for snow to cover the earth in gleaming quiet, to give his squalid, fractious city a day of stillness in the new year. This was the first new year since his wife had died 25 years before that Fukuji had company for the holiday. A strange guest, to be sure, more like a sparrow fallen from its nest. Last night, the swordsmith had gone to the fire when the alarm was called and he had stumbled over a limp form in the street. He had picked up the boy and carried him home, not knowing if he was alive or dead. He could hear the rattled breathing of the boy from within the house. Fukuji crossed the stone floor of the kitchen and stepped up into the house. The boy lay in the inner room. Fukuji had laid him on his own pallet and covered him with quilts. The boy was not badly burned, but he had breathed in the foul smoke and poisoned his lungs. Now he burned with fever. Fukuji wiped the young face. He went down into the kitchen and rinsed the rag in cold water from the well, wrung it out, and replaced it on the boy's forehead. The child opened glazed eyes, but Fukuji could not tell whether he was conscious or not. He had sent a neighbor's boy to fetch a doctor earlier, but many had been injured the night before in the fire, and there was no doctor free to come to the shop. So Fukuji nursed the boy as best he could. He washed the thin body with well water in a battle with the fever that seemed to grow more intense by the hour. Each tortured breath the boy took cut through Fukuji's own chest like a jagged knife. The snow falls and disappears, he thought, without hope. But he fought on through the night, doing the only thing he knew to do, washing the boy's burning trunk and limbs with the icy water. Just before dawn, the fever broke. Sweat poured from the boy's body, soaking the pallet. Fukuji piled every quilt he owned on the small bony frame, then stretched himself out on the bare mat floor and fell asleep. When he looked out the next morning, the courtyard was white with a thin covering of snow. In the streets of the capital, children frolicked in the snow. They divided themselves into rival teams of Heike and Genji and bombarded each other with snowballs. But in his villa at Rokuhara, General Kiyomori of the Heike clan was in no mood for games. The capital is seething with rumors, sir. Tada, his retainer, was speaking. The two men were sitting cross-legged on the mat floor, sipping warmed rice wine. The general's face was set in grim lines as he listened to his retainer's account of the New Year's disturbances in the capital.
Is there any evidence that General Yoshitomo is behind the troubles? Yoshitomo was the chief of the Genji clan and thus Kiyomori's prime rival for power. The retainer shook his head. No one knows. People will say anything. It is even said in some quarters, the warrior glanced sidelong at his lord, that the fire on Rokujo Avenue was set at your command. Phew! Kiori made a sound of disgust at this absurd rumor. And what is being said in court? On the surface, nothing. Presumably everyone is so involved in the New Year's feasting that they've hardly noticed the fires in the street squabbling among the soldiers. But you may be sure that those wine-reddened noses are sniffing the wind. And the young emperor? I think Counselor Shinzai can assure him of your loyalty. Hmm. I wonder. There are many Genji mouths pouting about the court these days. Then will you take some action? Ah, Tada. I am a soldier a bit weary with soldiering. We have had scarcely two years of peace. I need time to see to my own affairs. He took a long sip of the wine and sighed. I have not yet made a pilgrimage in honor of my father's death, and he has been dead nearly six years. If war comes, it comes, and I will fight, but I will not blow on the embers. The fire that burns the city may destroy Rokuhara as well. The fire that had, died, that had burned in Muna's body died slowly. The raging visions of his delirium focused into one cold line. Takanobu is dead. His eyes were slower in focusing on his unknown surroundings, but his brain beat out the one thing it remembered. Takanobu is dead. Takanobu is dead. In Awa, there was a grove of pines along the shore. The wind off the sea had twisted the ancient trunks and limbs so that they bent grotesquely against the strength of it, their roots like gnarled fingers holding tenaciously to the rocks. There was one tree. Muna must have been very young when he discovered it. One tree that stretched out a giant arm across the rocks. As long as he could remember, Muna had run to it and climbed into the lap that the great limb made at the trunk. It was his place for sorrow and anger and dreams. He could sit there quite hidden for the upper limbs bowed over the large lower one, making a tent with their profusion of green needles. When the other peasants called him Muna, the no-name, and taunted him as a nothing that even such as they could despise, Muna would flee to the tree and stay for hours huddled against the trunk. He would listen to the waves roar in and break on the rocky shore and harden his ears against the piteous cry of his mother, Jai Chen, Jai Chen. She never called him Muna, but Little One, a baby name that he both liked and resented. Chai Chen, Chai Chen. The waves roared in. Takanobu is dead, slapped the unfeeling rocks. Takanobu is dead, crashed the cruel rocks. In his comforting green haven, the smell of rosin and needles tickled his nose his nose. He began to be aware that the lining of his nose and throat were burning with each breath. The fire on Rokujo Avenue. He remembered now the smoke and the choking despair, but how, he, how had he come here to this strange haven between a pallet and warm quilts? 
He fingered the padded cover. It was a coarse, cheaply dyed material, but to Muna, it seemed very grand. He propped himself up on one elbow. Before him was a wall of shutters, which, to judge by the sounds from the other side, opened directly onto the street. So, he was in a shop of some sort. To his left, sliding paper doors were pushed back, revealing a room of equal size where he could see a low table and beyond, a step or two lower down, the kitchen. But when he turned to look to his right, he saw with a thrill of wonder what sort of shop it was. For the right wall was hung with swords. Some of the long swords hung in scabbards, richly ornamented with jeweled birds and flowers. But several of the weapons were unsheathed, their long curved blades catching the dim winter light from the kitchen doorway. To Muna, the swords seemed to be almost living creatures as he watched them, the light dancing over the varying surfaces of the gleaming blades. His father would own a sword like one of these. His father. In the months since he had come to the capital, the dream of the brightly armored samurai had grown dimmer rather than brighter. Strange. At first, as he worked in the stables, he had sought out a hikey retainer of one of the guardsmen and tried in his shy country way to ask him of his father. But he stuttered and blushed as he heard himself asking if the soldier might know a high-ranked Haiki who had served General Kiyomori 14 years ago in Awa. <sighs> Even as he framed the question, he became aware of its absurdity. The stable master interrupted them with one of his kicks, sending Muna back to work. The boy was almost grateful to be spared the look of ridicule on the Haiki retainer's face. Muna had continued to listen to the conversations at the stables, but more and more, he realized, he had listened for stories to tell Takanobu and not for clues to his father's identity. But a sword maker's shop. Once again, the boy felt that the gods had interfered. Takanobu had been taken so that he might begin to search in earnest for his father. And what better place to begin than in a sword maker's shop. A sword maker like this one would know all the prominent samurai in the capital. I must make him like me, Muna thought. I must make him want me to stay on with him. Muna breathed a prayer for help to the spirit of his mother and for a good measure, a prayer to the spirit of Takanobu, though he had private reservations as to the Ronin's standing on the other side. Then he began to cough, so he lay back between the warm bedding. Later, there would be plenty of time to investigate the house. A new year has dawned. I wish you happiness. At the traditional greeting, Muna turned with a start. A man, surely the swordsmith himself, knelt beside the quilt. A new year has dawned. Muna replied in a strange, hoarse voice, This year again, I beg your kindness. Rest quietly, the man said. Don't try to talk. Here. He propped a quilt behind Muna's head. See if you can drink some New Year's soup with me. I beat out the rice dumplings on the anvil. That should make them especially lucky, eh? Something warned Muna that the swordsmith was joking and he ventured a smile. The man grinned in reply. He isn't going to be so hard to please, thought Muna. The hot sugared soup hurt his raw throat, but Muna drank it down manfully. Everything was going to be all right. The swordsmith liked him already. <laughs>